Welcome to the Strength Athlete Podcast, episode number 20. It's been a little bit of a break for us uh, going through the new year and with those holidays, but we are very excited to bring our show back to you with a series of new guests we have planned in the new year. Before we get started, just a quick shout out to the sponsor of the Strength Athlete Podcast. That is going to be SBD USA. They have partnered with us in an effort to <clears throat> help us to keep our show on the air, as well as to provide a little bit of an incentive for you guys. So if you're interested, you can get free shipping at the SBD USA. USA website. Sorry, international listeners, this only applies in the U.S. The code for free shipping is going to be all capitals, S-B-D-T-S-A. Alternatively, you can go to their website. That's going to be sbd-usa.com forward slash T-S-A, and they will give you some details there about how to use that coupon code and what is entailed therein. Additionally, if you are enjoying the show, please do make a point of visiting the iTunes store on your phone or on your computer in the iTunes application and leaving us a five-star review on this podcast. It does help us to be seen more, which helps us to make more episodes for you, the people. And from here, I will pass it off to Bryce. Hello, guys. Uh, Welcome back to the Strength Athlete Podcast. Uh, This is episode 20. I've got Eric Bodhorn here. I've got Christopher Aiden and our guest today. Uh, John Keeley from the University of Central Lancashire, um, also the Institute for Coaching and Performance. Um, Say hey, guys. Good morning. Hey, guys. Nice to meet you. So uh, we'll be talking today a little bit about um, some of the things that uh, Keeley has written about, some concepts on on stress um, and periodization. But before we get into that, uh, Happy New Year to everyone as well, since this is the first one we've done since the new year, as we head into 2018 and another year of continuing to get stronger. Um, so John, um, I've been a, a fan of these two essays and some of your other work for quite a while. Um, I read them a number of years ago and, and, um, I was really impressed with kind of how, how broad uh, you're able to think and, and link concepts together from disparate areas. Um, and looking at your research gate profile as well, it seems like you have your hands dipped in uh, just a number of different areas. Uh, research as well, but um, can you tell us and the listeners a little bit more about uh, how you got started and and what a little bit of your background story is? Uh, Sure, yeah. Well, first of all, thanks very much for the uh, encouraging words on my writing. Uh, Writing is something I struggle with uh, every day. I I find it really hard, but I find it really good to to clear up my mind. Um, None of these... None of those writings came easily. They all took a embarrassingly, disgustingly long (laughs) amount of time, and they were building for years. So basically, my backstory was um, athlete. I was a combat sports athlete, started off as a kickboxer, national champion, couple of international titles, switched to boxing in my kind of mid-20s, which was really late, uh, but... Uh, got a, won a couple of national titles there. Literally bummed around the international scene for a few years. Occasionally doing well, most often or not. Getting mugged, but learning a lot about international competition. Uh, and I think we hear so much about uh, great athletes that uh, my personal experience was of a very average athlete mixing with some very good athletes, and it's a very different experience than the one you normally hear about. So anyway, so so good practical background. I was coaching young, maybe I was coaching from my early 20s. Um, when I was around 26, 27, decided I needed to do, make a change in my life, went to university to study sports science, came out of that, went into a job working with elite athletes in Ireland, just very luckily uh, went to Scotland to do a master's with Professor Mike Stone, who you may have heard of. He's in East Tennessee at the moment. Um, Yeah, and came back to Ireland, worked with some national governing bodies, worked with some good athletes, got offered a, was at a track and field event in maybe Finland in 2005 and got approached by a representative of UK Athletics there was a job coming up there. Was I interested in applying? I applied for that and then ended up as the, the head of strength and conditioning for UK athletics for a number of years. Wow. The, Beijing, the Beijing Olympic cycle. And then I stayed on in a kind of consultant basis until the end of the London cycle. Uh, from there, 
I know it's getting long now, so uh, I'll try and wrap it up quick. Uh, <clears throat> my partner was back in Ireland, locked into a job. I was in the UK, locked into a job. I was looking for a, a happy medium. Uh, and I was offered a post in a university that I could do from Ireland, little village in Ireland, in my slippers if I wanted to, via Skype, working with elite practitioners, coaches, SNCs, physios, performance directors, uh, people basically who are interested in doing professional doctorates, that is progressing pra their practical work to kind of doctoral level thinking. So, so that's what I do. That's half of my life. The other half of my life is I, I contract out and, and I work uh, <laughs> practically with athletes. So I guess in the past few years, after 2012 games, 2013, I worked with a lady called Laura Massaro, who's a great athlete. Uh, she became the world squash champion in 2013. 2014, 15, and 16, I worked with Irish rugby during championships. So in that time, we won the Six Nations 2014 and 2015 uh, and travelled to the Rugby World Cup with them. Uh, this year, uh, I will be at, in Russia for the, the Football World Cup with, with one of the countries there. So what I'm trying to do is get the balance between I get plenty of time to sit down and bang my head off a wall trying to write and then I get some some practical balance that I, you know, I, I get to work with real life athletes. So that's the dream. It doesn't always work out, but so far so good. <laughs> well, I, I commend you. That's a fantastic story. And, and uh, I, I wanted to ask what it was like being the head of UK athletics um, for an Olympic cycle. Like what kind of responsibilities did that entail? Um, what did that feel like? Sorry. So I, it was head of strength and conditioning for, for athletics. Not, not head of athletics. Right, I understand. Hell yeah. Um, it was, it was one of these jobs. If you if you get a name as a good practitioner, you know that you work with a couple of good athletes, or somebody sees your work and thinks yeah, that's really good work. Uh, people assume that you can also do a good management job. So I am only interested in being a, a good practitioner and evolving my thought processes. I'm not interested in the management side. So there was a little bit of a settling down period where it was, I want to work with these athletes. I don't necessarily want to deal with all this admin stuff. Can we work something out? And there was a lot of over and back like that. And a lot of, in, a, in every job like that, there's a lot of, there's a lot of errors. There's a lot of learning. Uh, uh, so yeah, so I got to work with some great athletes. I got to work with some really good practitioners. I got to work with some excellent track and field coaches. So yeah, it was it was a good experience. But like all these experiences, um, nobody gets out alive in terms of you make your mistakes. Yeah. So, um, kind of getting into our topics a little bit. Uh, one of your earlier essays that I that I read that I mentioned previously in 2012 was on um, stress and just where the the history of stress has, has taken us. Stress in, in a broad sense, not in terms of someone being stressed out uh, from their job, although that's certainly inclusive, but um, stress to include the type of uh, response that it takes to make someone stronger and um, cause changes to homeostasis. Can you talk just a little bit about kind of the history of stress and um, your experience with learning about that. Well, I guess where all this started off was was me as a coach, or before that, me as an athlete, trying to figure out what the best program was. And you do what any young person who's keen does: is you get as much information as you can, you read, and the only real messages that were out there at the time were the, the old Soviet messages, which were very formulaic. If you want this, then do this. So predictable input leads to predictable output. Uh, and that was the pervading message. Um, 
but unfortunately, no two people could agree on what the right organization of that training was, or no two countries could agree, or no two organizations could agree. So I guess I went on, uh, I don't want to call it a quest, that's kind of over, over, over egging it, but just trying to figure out what it looks like. And eventually, I, I started out thinking that there was a right answer. Mm. That there, you know, there was, and now I know that there isn't a right answer. It's, it's all about trade-offs and compromises. And it's the more good ones you make, the better your program will be and the better your outcomes will be. But, you know, where I started out was trying to evolve the perfect program. Now I try to evolve a program that's better than, it, it is as good as I can make it. Now, I guess where, where I came in with that 2012 paper, and again, that wasn't, you know, uh, I wasn't lying in the bath and it came to me. <laughs> that was 10 or 15 years banging my head off the wall thinking, it, it, could it be this? Could it be this? I need to read this, but this guy or this girl says this. So it was just really trying to map out my confusion in writing and come to some type of conclusion out the back end of it. And, and I guess there was a number of points that I, there was a number of key points to make for anyone who's who's putting together programs. And one is that the amount of inter-individual variation to any given training program is big. It is big. We tend to assume we will respond relatively similarly, but when you measure it. That doesn't seem to be the case. And obviously, a lot of this goes down to your genetic makeup and genetic predispositions. Does the type of training you're, do, you're doing suit those predispositions or not? Uh, that's part of the equation. It's not the full equation. Um, the other thing then, and I, I guess this is where your question came in, is the history of periodization leans a lot on the science of stress to justify some of its conclusions. Mm. Now, I guess the key point here is that it doesn't lean on 21st century stress science. It leans on early 20th century stress science, which is a very, very different thing. So the early 20th century, I'm sure your listeners would have heard of Walter Cannon in Harvard and Hans Selye. And, and they were really the early pioneers. And I, I guess for me, it's just getting our head around that when they were doing their research, it was a very different worldview. It was a time where we, we like to look at complex phenomena and have a very mechanical way of describing them. X plus Y equals Z. X plus Y plus Z equals. Uh, and Selye came out with some basic findings. So Selye's research was on rats. His job basically was being nasty to rats. Um, when you're nasty to rats, they respond with a stress response. And that stress response causes certain uh, structural changes within their glands. Now, this is how it was both groundbreaking, insightful, uh, you know, at the time, but this is how gross, how basic it was. You would, let's say he would get rats and he would put them on the roof over the course of winter in an open cage. So a severe physiological stress. He, he was in uh, Canada, by the way. And then at the end of that season, he would sacrifice the rats and he would weigh certain glands like adrenal glands and compare that to a normal rat. Like that's how gross, you know, how how uh, how blunt his measuring stick was. Right. So, I mean, it's a miracle he came up with any insights, and he did. Um, he came up with some good insights. Uh, basically, that if you physiologically stress someone, that there is some type of adaptation. That ad adaptation can be positive or negative. Uh, that adaptation, if you stress some, some uh, a rat for too long, you're going to do severe health damage. There's going to be a negative effect. Uh, and, and, and that's really where his messages came from. So from that, he published a, a, 
a kind of a, a landmark paper in Nature in 1936, basically describing this phenomenon. And he, he later came to call that the general adaptation syndrome. And you will know that and be familiar with it and love it from all our, you know, our grandmother reading us periodization stories. And right. there's always that graph in the corner, the general adaptation syndrome, uh, which basically says that uh, if you uh, impose a physiological, a physical challenge, then there is a period where you become weaker and then you get stronger. Unless that challenge is excessive or relentlessly unremitting, and then you move into breakdown. Uh, okay, so that makes a lot of common sense. I think it's intuitively appealing, and nobody could argue with it. I mean, anyone who has trained or trains know that that is the case. If you do too much of anything, it, it's going to cause a problem. It's all about baby bear's porridge. It's all about what's the right dose. Or what's broadly the right dose? If I get it wrong, I'm undertrained or I'm overtrained. Now, there was a couple of really, really good coaches around the, the 50s who kind of jumped on this message. I guess the first one I've come across was Forbes Carlyle, who was a, a swim coach in Australia. And he instantly saw the logic of this and used it to help construct his training paradigm. Subsequent to that, there was a number of other... Um, coaches, perhaps most famously in the States, Doc Councilman, the, the, the great swim coach. And they saw this GAS and, and you know, the, the nice graph and said, yeah, that makes sense. And it's all about the right dose and giving the right dose at the right time, not too much, not too little. Absolutely makes intuitive sense. So that's the message that we in sport took from Celia's work. There's a predictable Again, his curve was very predictable. This is what will happen. His environment was a very, it was a time when scientific understanding was co co the chaos, complexity, that hadn't come into the kind of public dialogue or pub public conversation. It was more about measure. Uh, a controlled uh, input equals a predictable output. Uh, basically mechanical, a very mechanical worldview. Celia's paradigm fitted in well to that. Mm. Now, I guess the uh, how's that that's relevant to us is that if you look at periodization, that's effectively what periodization is. It's it's let's take this mechanical worldview, let's break it down into quantifiable chunks, and let's come up with what is the best way of of uh, structuring inputs to go from here to there, to go from uh, not ready for competition to absolutely ready for competition. And we can't argue with that. That's That all seems common sense. I guess where, for me, where the wheels start to come off isn't with Celia's work, but it's how some later periodization theorists started to nearly overinterpret that as justification for very specific types of training templates. Mm. So this is the best approach. Uh, and again, if, you're, if your mindset is mechanical, then it is, it's just an equation you're trying to solve, and there is such a thing as a best approach. And then if you look at all the, the, the great periodization theorists, you know, Matviev, Zatskiarsky, Verkoshansky, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It was all about, and it was really like a little schoolyard squabble. Don't listen to him. Don't listen to him. Listen to me. And and if you read some of their their writings, like certainly, you know, it it it, it does get pretty dirty. And it's like, follow me. The way the truth, the light is true, <laughs> rather than having a kind of a, a, a having an open conversation about it. So, okay, so that brings me back around to, to that paper you mentioned in 2012. So we have this, you know what? It's clear now that there's, there's quite a wide diversity of biological responses to any imposed stress. Any training stress you give, you and your training partner will not respond the same way. In fatigue, 
uh, you won't have the same uh, psychological response to it. You might think, I really buy into this. I really believe in this. The training partner, the partner doesn't. Uh, you will have different, uh, different genetic predispositions that will influence things. You'll have different training experiences that will influence things. You'll have different belief systems around the training that will influence things. So I guess the, the things that I was trying to bring to the fore in that paper were all this inter-individual inter variation. Why are we still looking for their right solution? Why are we looking for their right formula that here's what you do, the, you know, the, the five steps to the best training? Yeah. It doesn't really, at least to me, it, it doesn't really exist. I can't see how it exists, given everything we've just talked about. Uh, I, when I was writing that paper, like that was, I, I was just transitioning from a, you know, just a hardcore practitioner to someone who was an academic. Uh, and I'd read somewhere that the average paper is read by seven people. And I, I, I was thinking, I, I'm glad only seven people will read this because I'm going to laugh at it. Seemed that everyone else was, you know, it's kind of like the emperor's new clothes, but I was not at all confident. It was like, I'm obviously missing something because nobody else is saying this. Yeah. As it turns out, people were saying that and people were thinking that it's just, I wasn't aware of it. But I had so many coaches approach me after that and saying, hey, that's what I see every day, you know, at the track or in the gym. And um, so, so that was like uh, wildly encouraging to me. And I, I was embarrassed sending that out. I thought I was going to get shot down. Uh, just to keep plowing on while, um, <clears throat> while I'm at it, one of the things I mentioned there but probably didn't round up well was the one of the other messages that came from Celia's work is, and, and Celia himself believed that physical stress had physical consequences, but he wasn't, he did not certainly in his early work, factor in, well, is there psycho-emotional issues that have physical consequences? Mm -hmm. He did not. Now, later, towards the end of his life, he came to prevaricate around that a little bit. You know, and he admitted, you know, I, I always assumed it was physi physiological challenge, physiological response, full stop. And one thing that's become clear since, I guess, kind of mid-60s, but... Celia's paradigm was so dominant that it, it didn't really come into the sport and consciousness is that your psycho-emotional state when you're training or when you're competing has a huge impact on subsequent adaptation. So in the same way that, I mean, it's now crystal clear and we all appreciate it, if if you have a job where you're exposed to severe psychological stress every day, that's going to have a health consequence. But periodization never and has never to this day acknowledged that. Um, and I guess the, there's one example from the research that I always come to because I, I think it's a really good one. So just bear, bear with me for this. I'll, I'll try and get it right first off. <laughs> there's a researcher who looks at relationships, uh, you know, man, woman, male, male, but, but romantic relationships, uh, whatever permutation they are. And he has a lab, so he brings people in. And let's say he brings in 20 couples and they're in these kind of hermetically sealed bubbles that can be observed, that can be documented. And he introduces a little histamine reaction. So he, for all the world, he, he gives you a little sting. He introduces a little poison, let's say on your forearm. So you get that little rash that you get after a, a, a nettle sting. And then if me and my partner are getting on well, and emotionally we're tuned in and everything is relaxed and calm, I heal within a day. If you're in there with your partner and the wheels are coming off a little bit and you're getting on one another's nerves and you're arguing, you know, the same as we all do in relationships, three days. 300% increase. Oh. Now, now, obviously, everyone's going to, you know, that's, that's a study he did. 
group based average to be all inter individual differences but 300% difference based on your psycho emotional state so 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 okay so what's the underpinning logic behind that and for me it's uh, we impose training stimuli over a chemical backdrop okay so i have certain hormones running through my body uh, in a, in a, you know, in my circulation at a local level, I also have, you know, all kinds of uh, biochemicals. Now, what dictates that? Those that that bio that biochemical makeup in my body, in my muscles. Well, the majority of that comes from the direction of your brain. Your brain says, uh, "This is the situation that we're in at the moment. This is the chemical backdrop you need." Mm. So. Uh, I'm here, I'm talking to you guys, I'm a little nervous. My brain is kind of saying to me, okay, you're under a little bit of pressure here. It's hitting a button and I'm releasing a bit of cortisol. What's that cortisol doing? It's sharpening my thinking a, a little bit. It is, you know, I'm not yawning here. I was half an hour ago, I'm not now. It's a little bit of cortisol shot in there. Now, if I was to stay in this state for three days with that elevated cortisol level, that would not be good for my health. Mm -hmm. But if it's there in a temporary thing, then that's evolutionary adaptive. Um, so, so yeah. So let's take that sting example. If that, if a, a stimulus like that, set over a, a kind of a negative emotional state, can have such a detrimental effect to healing. What does it do to our training? What does it do to training recovery? And I think uh, the implications are pretty clear and the research the past couple of years is coming out and it's pretty clear. If you are stressed, and this has been done with certainly weight training professional rugby teams, uh, track and field athletes, um, and a number of different scenarios. If you are perennially st are stressed for a period while you're training, one injury risk goes up substantially two training adapt adaptations are blunted so the two big negatives we spend so much time trying to navigate around through our planning theory a lot of an awful lot of that can be mitigated by well what's the emotional backdrop of the athlete at the moment mm -hmm. and how can coaches design to to change that to optimize that that was um Kind of a follow-up question i have so we have this this background on um kind of w where stress response theory was limited in the past in terms of it being far too simplistic now we have this more complex model um we know there are other factors involved as practitioners um what do you do to either preempt that or or respond to that to get better responses out of athletes okay that's and that's a kind of $10 million question. Okay, so all theory is nice, but what does it mean in real life? Uh, okay, so I would think there's a couple of kind of levels. The first level is, for, for me at least, and I can only talk for myself here, if I'm planning, I'm thinking, okay, it's not all about what I think of the plan. It's not all about me sitting here in isolation in my bubble and putting together this fantastic Excel sheet that is going to tell the athlete what to do, when to do it. And, you know, and it's all nice and symmetrical and there's no remainder at the end. And I'm happy. It's not about what I think of the plan. It's also about what the athlete thinks of the plan. So it's also about how I communicate the plan to the athlete. It's also about how I communicate this is why I'm suggesting we do this because, you know, uh, this is what you need to work on, yada, yada, yada. And it's basically that we start to draw out, here's the proposed plan. Here's where you are. Here's where you want to be in X number of weeks or X number of years or at the end of your career. And then we draw a direct link between where you are now, the proposed program, and you fulfilling your dreams. We make that emotional connection. This is this is the plan to help you. Now, I think for me, and a, a lot of this depends on 
the, the, the level of athlete you're working with at the moment and the number of athletes you're working at the moment with at the moment. If you're in a situation where it's one-on-one -on, -one on a pretty regular basis with a, a good mature athlete with, with uh, a good training intelligence, then it's much more, here's my initial draft, but I want you to tell me what you feel mm -hmm. and then let's tweak. And if we need to trial you know, just have, have, have a little go and then tweak again, that, uh, we're happy to do that. So it's, it's much more about, because the athlete has special feedback that we don't have access to. They know when their joints are getting grumbly because of certain things or how they feel in the morning uh, after a certain session and all those kind of things. So, so with, an, with a good senior athlete where you have a good relationship and regular contact, you can do much more, more, much more of a collaborative thing. But if it's a squad of 30, 40 rugby players, you can't do that. But you can, you can, okay, we're changing phase today. We're having 10 minutes. I'm going to explain the background to why we're doing what we're doing. Mm -hmm. but so the last, and then we're going to have 10 minutes of Q&A. Uh, and maybe I, maybe I get to, to you pick three representatives from the squad, have a discussion amongst it yourselves, call, come back with some feedback, and if we'll tweak. So there's always some way of, of doing it, regardless of the scenario you're in. Now, I guess what I'm going the long way around saying is that's not something we've ever mentioned in periodization conversations. Sure. It's been what does it look like? How do we segregate it? How many weeks? My point is you know what, we really should be thinking about what does the athlete think of the plan? Does the athlete buy into the plan? Does the athlete see the plan as positive for them? It, or is it just something that, you know, coach thinks, I'm going to put some effort into it when he's looking, but, you know, I'm not going to put my heart into this because I know my back always feels cranky mm -hmm. the next or something like that. One thing um, we want to be able to do is separate the types of responses that are uh, biopsychosocially motivated and the types that are a, a result of what we put down on a plan you know like if i expect the athlete to do something based on the plan and they do it i want to be able to attribute that outcome either to you know good or bad biopsychosocial background or this is the training plan so is is there a specific data that you ask athletes in terms of uh, emotional backdrop? Do you ask them how they're feeling? Do you have them rate anything on a scale of one to 10? Do you, do you talk about stress at all or, or what's going on outside the gym? Uh, okay, so again, that's a, a really good practical question. And I'm not trying to sidestep it and I will tackle it, but it depends on the situation sure. and it depends on the athlete and the number of athletes and the time availability. My take is that, you know, I, I don't tell anyone else what to do. For me, it's like, there's all this information. What can we do with it? Here's what's right for me. So what I would do in that scenario, say it's an elite athlete, it's one-on-one, -on -one, it's contact maybe three or four times a week. I would have a, first of all, at the start of the training year, we would have had the conversation. What do we want out of this? What are our markers of success going to be? There won't always be good clean markers. So there might be a physical one, physiological test type one, or PB or within X percent of PB or something like that. And there'll be some sub subjective ones as well. Uh, athlete's perspective on are we going in the right direction, things like that. On a more so, so that would be there in the long term. On a more micro level, I walk into the gym, the athlete is there, I will have a list of questions. Now, it will only be, it might be three to five, depending on the athlete and their level of experience. And the, they will be designed that we can answer them in 60 seconds. So one will be for example, uh, how did you feel after the last session? How did you feel th the next morning? Okay. Uh, most elite athletes at senior level will have had prior injuries. Uh, let's say back is a good example. Is your back grumbly today? If, if, if that's a question we ask all the time, then we just have a rating on it. 
It's yeah, three out of five. I'm okay. Okay, perfect. Uh, are you clear on what we're here to do today? Yes or no? If no, then we talk about it. Adjust if necessary. Are you confident in that that you know that you're going to be able to do everything that we want to do to the level that we need to do it at today? Uh, yeah, great. Let's crack on. No, okay. Let's pick that apart a little bit. Feeling a bit fatigued? Do we need to tweak something? Maybe we'll take out some of the high power efforts and stick them into Thursday. That type of uh, soft kind of conversation, but small tweaks, small tweaks on a regular basis rather than large course corrections when we're obviously gone off the path. Mm -hmm. So, and for me, and the, my best piece of kit is I normally have a, little, a small notebook stuck in my waistband and a pen behind my ear and I'm just making notes. Athlete said, bit sore here, bam. I, I need to check that the next day. You know, um, yeah, so... To get back to your question, I would have a short list of three to five questions tailored to the athlete that we can answer in 60 seconds mm -hmm. and drive on. Let's go. I just had a follow-up question while we're on that topic. So, John, I think you've done a really nice job explaining how training adaptations are impacted by a lot more than just mechanical stress. So things like genetic factors, resilience to stress, training history, and current stress status. And it would seem the only thing that you can control out of those would be your current stress status. So what are some things that you would recommend to athletes in order to improve their current stress status? Okay, so I, I, I struggled a little bit in hearing that, but the key part I was taking out of it was what can athletes do for current stress levels? Right. Yeah. Uh, again, I think that's a question with big practical ramifications so i'm sure we've all been in the situation uh athlete arrives into the gym they they've been stuck in traffic they're they're running late somebody flipped flipped them off in the way they're you know they're they're angry or they're distressed because something was happening at home or something but they're obviously not in the right, uh, you could like the internal biochemical environment is obviously flooded with stress hormones for whatever reason. What can we do? Well, I would think, and the strategy that I use is before the session, there's always a what I think of as a reset to zero period. So that reset to zero might be, you know, what we're going to take a few minutes. Uh, yeah, and effectively, it's just, I wouldn't ask them to sit down and meditate or anything like that, but I would just talk through, here's what we're going to do. Here's why we're doing it. Uh, here's how, you know, you need to feel as we're going through these efforts. How do you feel about that? Uh, so just a kind of a decompression time. Uh, where it's nice, calm, chat, clarification. And then there would be a, what is the right emotional intensity for you to get the most out of this session? So if it's a hard, high intensity session, then there's a little bit of motivation. There's a little bit of um, motivational talk or, or maybe the warm up is a bit more aggressive, uh, depending on the context. Uh, if it's just a, a kind of a maintenance session, then obviously we want to keep people on a very level uh, keel. So, so it would be, okay, we know what we're doing. We can be nice and mellow here, so we need to make sure we're, we're nice and mellow. If you're pissed off about something, you know what? Take three minutes. Take three minutes before you start. start. Sit, sit down in the corner. Go through your training notebook. Have a think about why you're here. Reflect on the purpose of today and how today's session is going to contribute to your long-term development. And it's all about just getting the athlete's mind off whatever is freaking them out and getting it back onto, hey, here's what we're here to do today. Here's what we can control. Here's what you can control. Here's how you can contribute to your long-term life goals here and now. And 
I, I guess one of the uh, older definitions of stress, certainly in, in the psychology literature, was uh, s stress is all about perception of control. If you have somebody that's stressed, give them something they can control. Mm. There's some famous experiments with rats. Uh, you get two rats in a, in a vat of water. Or no, let's say they're, they're just in their cage and you give them an electrical shock. Uh, and you twin that electrical shock with, uh, they can turn the shock off if they press a button. And you train them then, they get a shock and they press the button. They get a shock, they press the button, the shock stops. Subsequently, what you can do after they're conditioned to that, you can, let's take the button out of one cage and we'll just randomly shock this guy and they can't do anything about it. Let's leave the button in this cage, but let's turn off the button so the button doesn't do anything. And we randomly shock this guy. And what you get is, so neither of them can do anything about the shock, but one of them has the sense of, if I press this button, I'm going to reduce this shock. And that rat has less stress and is less vulnerable to stress-related illness down the line. Does that make sense? Now, it's an extreme example. I don't I'm not suggesting you do that with athletes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope no, not, but yeah, it makes perfect sense. It's sense uh, of control. And I, I, again, for me, um, if I think about it in the context of, uh, let's suppose you have a combat athlete who's going abroad to fight in a strange arena. So it's a very stressful time for them. You know, you don't have teammates. So it's, you know, you're in a strange environment. You've never seen who you're going to be in against. What can that person do to mitigate their stress? And I think what you do is you fall back on your warm-up routine. You know your routine. I go through my, what stage one? I pack my bag, pick my spot in the changing room. What step two? You know, get out my kit, lay it out. What step three? Check time. How long do I need to warm up? 35 minutes. When am I in the ring? Blah, blah, blah. So you give them something to fill their mind, a kind of a routine that they're used to, a routine that no matter where they go in the world, no matter what other things are changing around them, they have this consistency that they can just dial into. And they're, they're then in their routine, and that's familiar. Everything else is unfamiliar, but my routine is familiar, and I focus on my routine. And I think that that's... Yeah, I, I think that's um, a really good way that we can help athletes manage kind of high stress environments. I think uh, it, it gives them control, like you were alluding to earlier, at least a, a sense that they have more control than they may. And that may be even be where um, some superstitions come from, like I have to wear my special underwear or you know use my special belt or whatever the case may be, because it's a sense of control in an environment that's relatively unpredictable. You know, uh, yeah, so that's a great example. Um, and one of the things I've been thinking a lot of recently that's very closely related to what you're talking about is how we as coaches can um, use the placebo effect and expectancy effects to promote positive performance. Mm. Now, I'm not at all suggesting we lie to people or try to fool people but yeah, placebo effect is a very is a very strange. Uh, well, it's a very misunderstood phenomenon. But I, but it, it really speaks to what you were talking about there. Is if if we can do something, and it can be training routines, it can be your lucky socks as long as you don't lose them, it can be any of those things. And it's all about just when you're in a strange environment, a stressful environment, control what you can control, keep your mind on what you can control. And that will reduce the overall stress. I mean, speaking of how biopsychosocial factors affect training, the placebo effect is certainly uh, probably one of the more notable things that you can do to, to affect training in different ways. There was a, a study on weightlifters uh, where they were given placebo steroids, uh, and, and the difference in outcome was enormous and there was even a dose response to placebo steroids as well in terms of uh, increase in strength yeah no absolutely and i think um i think it's one of the things that 
we're we're going to hear more of in our world, in the coaching world. And, and again, like I said, I, it's not about deception. It's, for example, can we manipulate our training environment slightly to make it more positive for athletes? Can I, can I change how I communicate with the athletes? Can I change, for example, if I'm somebody, if I'm somebody who, who gets pissy really easy and, external events affect me you know if, if the baby is crying am I always cranky the next day those type of things for me as a coach if I'm walking into the gym the first thing I do is try and take control of my mood my outlook so I will go through a like like you know like what I talked about for athletes I would go through a kind of a here's the quiet time beforehand where I'm going to refocus I'm going to get my mind on what I need to do I I I and so in the past few years, but now I do that, I have my routine. Uh, because, yeah, it just didn't sit right to be preaching it to others, but then me myself be victim to whatever else is going around me. I also need to take control of what's going on in my head, make sure I'm in the right zone, uh, make sure that I'm uh, well-grounded to give the best advice. And, and, and I think for coaches, it's important that we can be we present ourselves consistently to athletes. Mm. If the athlete doesn't rock up to train and think, well, which John Kiley is standing in front of me today? Is it the kind of manically good mood guy or is it this kind of semi-depressed guy? You know, Is it the someone who doesn't say anything or someone who's rat- rabbiting on all the time? So if, for me, it's just about no matter what's going on, it's, okay, how can I be consistent in my messaging in how I'm dealing with athletes. I don't have to be their best friend. I don't want to be their best friend, but it's consistency, trust, and respect, you know, on, on a regular basis, not most of the time, all of the time. Mm-hmm. So I had a follow-up question to both what Bryce and Eric asked you. Now, we, the people that we work with as powerlifters aren't full-time powerlifters. Um, they're full-time parents. They're full-time workers. They're students. Um, so they are very susceptible to all of these various stressors that we're discussing. So emotional, dietary, social, sleep, um, academic, long hours. Do you make any training decisions as a coach in terms of what you are going to prescribe for them? So if you have someone, for example, an academic that's approaching finals, for example, um, would you modify their training according to what's going on outside of the training? Yeah, I guess there's a there's a there's a simple easy answer, and then there's a slightly more in depth one. The simple easy one is yes. It's it, it's one of the oldest findings in this area is that university level athletes injuries spike at exam times, clear as day. Um, and I, I just add to that that recently, you know, the past three four years, that's coming through all the time. Um, Athletes who tend to have more perfectionist tendencies. In other words, athletes who beat themselves up if, if everything isn't right. More injuries, more burning, more staleness, more overtraining, more drops, less enjoyment. Uh, so perfectionism as a source of stress. Um, so yeah, so now the other thing I would say is Going back to your questions about exams and would I alter training. Uh, if it was a group, yes, I would. If it was, let's say we're dealing with you and you have exams, but you are an extremely resilient person who is very calm, perhaps by nature or perhaps because you've made yourself that way, who has adequate coping strategies. In other words, you're walking to the gym and you are going, I am parking all this shit from today. All the exams, all the hassle, that is parked. I'm going to spend my quiet time, I'm going to get myself in the right zone, and then I'm going to train. With you, it could be different. But there would have to be strategies, considerations in place. But as a general answer, then yes, if it was a team of players, you would have to. I think to ask this question a little bit differently, would you rather be proactive in your approach and know that if you have, say, a month ahead of high life stress, you're going to change your training approach to accommodate that? Or would you rather be reactive and see how they respond to it? It's a very tough question. Um, Here's what I do. If I was working with a group 
I, I would make a decision based on what I thought was the best strategy for the most people. If you're on an industry, so, and, and that would be, uh, you know what, we have a couple of easy weeks, in the, and let's use the university example, in the middle of term, we're going we're, we're gonna to push a bit harder, and then we're going to back off those last couple of weeks. So that would be a simple decision based on, uh, I don't have high contact time, and it's a large group of athletes. I'm making a decision based on what's going to likely to be best for most of them most of the time. If it's an individual athlete, then then we have to look at individual factors mm -hmm. because that's one of the really uh, complex, frustrating issues around stress. Maybe it's important for us to have our heads around it. What is stress for you might not be stress for me and vice versa. Mm -hmm. You know, if let's say um, what you call in fairgrounds, you know, the, uh, you get into a car and you're pulled up to the top and then it lets you go and you go through a load of loops. Oh, uh, um, like a roller coaster? Exactly like yeah. a roller coaster. I was just blanking on the name. <laughs> so for me, or sorry, for you, a roller coaster might be three minutes of fun. You know, and you get that hit of cortisol, you get that hit of adrenaline, and you come off the roller coaster and you're buzzing. For me, it's three minutes of screaming terror, and I come off there and I'm thrown up. I, I guess the point is that stress is a very different thing for different people. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why I think on the individual level, it's, it's, it's that basic advice, kind of know your athlete. But also, what I would do as a coach is talk to the athlete and say, you know, and, and have a regular dialogue. And I might even formalize it in terms of uh, every Monday, we're going to have, we're going to put five minutes aside just for a brief chat. And we've space to make that chat longer if we come across a couple of things. And then before that chat, I think of a couple of questions and I kind of formalize it like that. I think certainly me in the past, I... I think I, I over... I, I, in my head, I exaggerated how tuned in I was to athletes. I assumed I was more tuned in than I was. But, you know, you've heard of confirmation bias. And I look at an athlete and I talk to them and I think, oh, yeah, uh, I know what's going on. And, yeah, and in the past few years, I've come to think about, I, maybe you're not that tuned in. Maybe you're not actually that intuitive with the athletes. And maybe you need to check more not assume you know what they're talking about. So now what I do is I, I, like I have a couple of formalized questions. I have the informal conversation that all coaches do, of course, but I'd also have a couple of formal questions that I would ask them on a regular basis and I'd know their kind of standard answer. Um, and th that would just be an effort to try and get over that confirmation bias, try and get over that perception that everything's going well and if the athlete uh, doesn't say something to me then it's not happening or it doesn't exist mm -hmm. and I think it's I, I, I guess what it is perhaps is just trying to be try and put some kind of controls and constraints and some even though they're very fuzzy trying to put some measures around what information we can get and how we can use that and I think it's all about coaches as critical thinkers you know, yeah, and I think one of, as I've just mentioned there, one of the big pitfalls we fall into is after a while, we get experience, we get a bit of success, that leads to overconfidence, and overconfidence is kryptonite to good decision making. Mm -hmm. So I think, especially, you know, after a bit of, you know, you're, you're, you're coaching for, eight, ten years, you've had success. There's lots of good things in what you do. And I think we're all inclined to overemphasize the good things we do. And we're all inclined to have a little blind spot to the things we aren't doing. Whereas I think when I look at some of the, the really, really exceptional older coaches who have kept getting better, you know, they didn't plateau after 10 years or 15 years, they kept getting better. They were all self-reflective. Mm -hmm. It was all about 
it, it wasn't about finding ways to justify what I do. It's about finding ways to pick holes in what I do. And, and that's a skill set. And that's something I think that that's something to admire and to aspire to. I think it takes a tremendous amount of, of humility to, uh, to work on that, but also balance that with not beating yourself up as a coach, uh, all the time too. So recognizing flaws and finding ways to improve them without, um, becoming self-deprecating all the time. Yeah, uh, I think that's a great point. And, and I know in my own personal um, efforts to, to kind of navigate that, I went from, as a young coach, being very dictatorial, very, the Excel, you know, the Excel knows, the Excel sheet knows all. If it says it on the Excel, that's what we're doing. Then I swung way too far the other way and I became this, you know, big cloud of insecurities. Whereas, you know, you know, well, it's really complex. I don't know if I have an answer for that. You could do this, but you could do that. And you become, you know, you're, you're the opposite. You're, you're kind of spineless. You're racked with your, you're racked with doubt. And that is no good for an athlete. Yeah. So kind of now what I try and do is, place myself somewhere there in in the middle and it's like you know what there's no perfect solution it's what's the best solution for now if it's important i'm going to take some time to think about it but i can't take six weeks to think about it i need to make my mind up by this time i need to present to the, this to the athlete yeah. by this time but yeah um yeah so i'm going the long way around saying i i absolutely uh, relate to what you're saying and i've s struggled and suffered from too dogmatic <laughs> about security. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to conclude by talking a little bit about your most recent paper from November of, of 2017, so just a few months ago, um, about periodization theory again. Um, but what was the the purpose of revising some of your thoughts and um, and putting them in, and what made this different from your previous uh, information on periodization? Uh, so. Um, the previous paper I talked about, I talked quite a lot about inter-individual variability um, and how we don't all respond to the same extent in the same time frames based on all those things we talked about, uh, genetic predispositions, training bases, training histories, prior injuries, yada, 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 yada. And, and I mentioned psycho-emotional considerations. But I'd, I kind of just mentioned it and parked it. Um, and I wanted to go back and and talk about that some more. There's a, there was a lot of evidence that had come out in, in the subsequent years between 2012 and, and last year. Uh, There's quite a bit on, on injuries and, and high stress, for example. And there was some stuff just starting to come out on stress definitely blunts your training and your, your ability to adapt to training. So I guess it was self-interest in terms of I was really interested in that and I find writing a really good way to try to figure it out. If you can explain it to somebody, to a stranger in writing, you probably understand it. Mm. Uh, and it was, I guess, an excuse for me to just dive into the research for a couple of years and, you know, bang my head off that wall and just try and figure it out. Um, and I, I'm, I'm not saying I have, but I'm certainly much further down the line than I was in 2012. I, and I felt it was... A story that was worth telling I think you know it's not going to be accepted by everyone as is right and proper you know some people won't like it some people will like it but to me it seemed like a story worth telling and it's not something that we've really ever had in our periodization debate it's only the past year or two that people are starting to talk about you know athlete buy-in faith in the plan belief in the plan um, constructing your environment and your communications in a way that that aligns with the ethos and the philosophy and the, the morals that you want as part of your training atmosphere, your, your you know training bubble, and, and that you want your athletes to be part of and to buy into, and all those things um, they count. They actually matter. They actually matter physiologically, biologically. They make a difference, uh, which is which is important to know, right? 
it, it's extremely yeah. important. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I can think of examples both both in my own training uh, as an athlete and, and in the training of, of other athletes as well um, that directly speak to that point. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm, you know, I'm sure, and I guess that's the good thing of being a hard trainer as well as somebody who, who thinks about things. We've all had, if we all went back again, we'd do it different, right? Yeah, I, and one of the things that I do is, you know, don't sweat the small stuff. <laughs> um, you know, have your you know training is sacrosanct recovery is sacrosanct plan it out do it well but don't worry about it all the time outside of when you're yeah, when you can't focus on something else sure well, well we'll link all these papers uh in the show notes but i get one more question in yeah chris go for it um so this latest paper you published in november um kind of just basically challenge the notion or conventional beliefs of periodization. Is there any new emerging or relatively recent research on stress that could be applied to future periodization models or current periodization models? So you're, I mean, I, I appreciate your work. I, I really enjoyed reading it. Um, basically what I'm trying to get at, is there any current stress research that either old periodization models could be applied to and changed or it, it can incorporate those stress models or are there research and stress that future periodization models should be more aware of when developing those models? Do you understand the question? Yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, okay. Yeah, and thanks because I think that gives us an opportunity to talk with, excuse me, about something really important. Um, I think par partially through my own kind of clumsy writing, uh, I seem to be kind of considered the anti-periodization guy. Um, but ultimately, periodization is just a word. Uh, you can call any plan a periodized plan in a sense. The definition has shifted from what it originally was. I don't care what people call my plans or, or their plans. I, I guess what I do think is relevant, though, is that we broaden our perspective of what good, good planning is. Yeah, and it's not just, it, it can be, this is the structure that I like. And you can take that structure from, you know, what this country used to or what, what that athlete used to or what this theory suggests. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. All of all of the periodization templates that we have followed or know and love are pretty wild guesses. And that's okay, because that's all we got in a sense. So I would say pick a periodization template you like by all means, but just be aware that they, they, they were all formulated from, from kind of a, a blinkered view and there's lots more things that go into effective planning and there's lots more, more things that go into conditioning, optimal conditioning of an athlete, like, for example, the, the psycho-emotional stuff, uh, like um, ensuring buy-in, faith, personal relationships, coach being a good communicator, athlete having crystal clear understanding of why they're doing what they're doing and how it should feel. All those things aren't mentioned in the periodization l l literature, but we need to factor them into how we think about training planning. Mm -hmm. So going back to, to you know, the other part of your question, I think that you'll all have in your heads, as have I, this is what, this is what I think is a good planning structure. And it might fit nicely into its conjugate sequence or it's, it's, you know, block or it's this or that. To me, I'm not sure that matters. I think, I think it's, I think the important thing is how you, not the template, but how you control training. So for example, you might like block periodization. So, and I would say block periodization sounds good. Are you used to it? Have you used it a lot? Mm -hmm. If no, then I think, okay, well, it might be worth a try because one of the big drivers of positive change, of, of positive adaptation is change. You keep doing the same thing the same way, the same level all the time. That's diminishing returns right there. So change. But it's, it, it's not a one-sided deal. Biggest time of risk is a time of sudden change. 
okay. So it's not just change is all good. It's a, it's, it, it's a trade-off. It's a dynamic balance. So I need to introduce change subtly, and I need to have change consistently. Okay, so park that. That's one consideration. Another consideration is there are certain things that you want to do with your power lifters that are absolutely set in stone. I know if I want them to lift like this, they need to be tipping. They need to be doing this on a regular basis. So there's your, there's your training spine that you have to put in there. Mm -hmm. But again, that can fit into any periodization structure. Mm -hmm. um, so I would be, let me see. There was something else I was going to say. There's a couple of other compromises there. Uh, so there's consistency, which I'm suggesting there, but there's also overuse as the kind of the, the evil twin of consistency. If I keep doing something too much the same way, then I'm exposed to injury. So I need some variety around that as well. So I, I guess what we're gradually building up on is it's all trade-offs. It's all what's the best decision for this athlete now. I can put those, as long as I negotiate those trade-offs, uh, monotony versus variation, sudden change versus no change, um, overuse versus underuse. As long as I can navigate those in a sensible way doesn't matter what I call it doesn't matter what it looks like but that's what I need to do not sure if I hit your, if that I hit your question perfect. that was perfect in my opinion <laughs> <laughs> um, John I want to say it was it was awesome seeing that the full text of I think all the papers that I came across were just freely available and not behind a paywall. Uh, was there some decision that influenced that? Well, I, I guess it's just spitting it. I mean, if, if you're writing someone something, I think you have, yeah, writing something and pushing it out for publication, for me at least, is uh, I am not naturally confident. I automatically assume they will be pointed at and laughed at. So it's nearly a masochistic kick it out into the outside <laughs> world just spit it out there well it's it's appreciated i just wanted to include one more thing before we go so in your most recent paper you had a paragraph that touches on specificity of training and that's something that's kind of near and dear to our hearts in powerlifting as a lot of the training that we do is very specific to the competition so i just actually wanted to quote a few sentences here because I think it does a good job of touching on some of the challenges that we face on a regular basis as coaches. So I'll quote you. We need a focus on event-specific movement skills, but excessive specificity accentuates structural wear and tear and amplifies the probability of overuse syndromes. Effort must be balanced with recovery. Desired benefits must be weighed against inevitable risks. And I think those are all things that we have to work through back and forth as coaches in our decision-making processes. You know, I think um, for me, that's the big take home in my own work. It's there is no right answer. I need to work to find the best answer. I need to work by thinking hard about it. But then at the same time, I need to present it to the athletes with sufficient confidence that they get confidence from it. Uh, but all those complex negotiations, I, I guess for me personally, I spent so long trying to do the perfect program, but you know, it doesn't exist. It's just being happy with, this is a good program, um, but I'm gonna make sure the athlete has their say, that they believe in it, that they buy in, expectations are high, all those type of things. Um, and, and that's, I guess, the journey that I've been on from close-minded, regimented, I'm just going to do what the Soviets told me because, you know, they're obviously right to, yeah, I guess where I am now, which is just, if I'm planning a program, my first commitment is, okay, this is going to be a hard, a hard couple of hours work, but I got to do it. It makes me think that the goalposts for some algorithm just being able to spit out the right approach are far down in the future because of things like buy-in and what's going on in someone's life and, and stuff like that, that, you know, despite great amounts of, of information, 
even a, an extremely complex algorithm wouldn't be able to create the right approach for an athlete. I mean, I agree. And I see it in, in so many sports now because of the so much technology that, yeah, sometimes you think that maybe, because I've swung from really liking numbers to now thinking yeah, the numbers are important, but only, they're only hints. You still need to talk to the athlete, look in the athlete's eyes. You know, you still need to, you still need to develop that kind of, that coaching art, that sense of, you, ha you still have to build that training atmosphere, that training ethos, that training environment, that trust, faith, belief, you know, positive progress, all those things are, I, and I guess now the science is catching up. You know, there was good coaches going back generations who used to do that. Mm -hmm. The science was against them, whereas now it's swung back. And I think, to me, that's what all this stress and emotional stuff says, is that you've got to take care of these things. You've got to take care, care of the whole person or the competitor won't flourish. Yeah. Um, are we good for now, guys? I'm done. <laughs> John, John I'd, I'd love to have you back on at some point. Uh, so many different directions we can take this. Um, but I thank you so much for your time. And uh, I want to ask you kind of what's what's on your plate right now in terms of research? What's what's coming up in 2018? Uh, yeah, so um, I have quite a bit of work on. I'll be doing a, a, a lot of writing for myself. I guess what I'm interested in really sinking my teeth into is actually the placebo effect, expectation effects. Um, uh, and, and hopefully that will happen this year, but I'm a really, really slow writer. So uh, from a practical perspective, I, I'll have the Football World Cup during the summer, so, so that will be interesting. Uh, and my daily job working with the kind of doctoral students keeps me going, and I, I work with some really good people uh, so yeah, so that keeps me challenged. So yeah, and then I will try and get out and train myself on a regular basis. That always perfect. Well, uh, we appreciate your time so much. Um, I'd love to back uh, have you back on here at some point in the future. Uh, again, this podcast is sponsored by SBD. Um, use the code TSA SBD for free shipping. They've got some new um, red line of of uh, wrist wraps, knee sleeves, and, and stuff like that. So uh, check it out. And uh, we'll be back with another episode as we head into 2018. So thanks very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you.